Well, hey everybody, I am Allison Alley, and I am here with my friend, Anu George Kanjanatopal. And we are wives, we're moms, we're leaders, and we're excited just to have a conversation today. Absolutely, and this is my good friend, Allison Alley, who's the CEO of Compassion Canada, a dynamic, passionate woman who cares deeply about how churches respond to the needs of the vulnerable. Amazing. Thanks for that introduction, Anu. In the spirit of that, I need to tell you that this woman um, is the still new, do you call yourself new, you know, CEO of IJM Canada. She stepped in in fall 2019. Do I have that right? You have that right. Around the same time that I did and has an amazing heart for justice and for compassion and to mobilize Christians and the church in Canada to prioritize the needs of the poor, the oppressed, and the marginalized. So it's been a real joy just to get to know you over these last two years. Oh my gosh, I could not be more excited <laughs> to finally see you in person after three years of remote conversations talking about challenges and working hard things through together. That's right. This, this is amazing. This moment right now for the rest of you is the first time we have I met know. in person, if you can believe it. So it is pure joy for us, if nothing else, uh, just to sit together and have a conversation. So in the spirit of Mother's Day, this is why Anu and I wanted to sit together and have a candid conversation as moms, as wives, as women, but also as leaders of organizations who work with and for women around the world. Yes. So why are you excited to have this conversation? For reasons more than one, Alison. <laughs> oh my goodness. I realized when we were working in the field, yeah. because the nature of our work is so hard, I mean, it's just natural, you know, it's, it's basic need of a survival even to come together to yeah. collaborate and work in partnership. And after having experienced that in the field for more than a decade, I come here to an advancement office in North America and I'm like, okay, it's a lot different because yeah. there is a tendency for us to look at collaboration or look to collaboration only where there is a need. Yes. And when the going is not as tough as it is, yeah. we tend to look each, at each other as more of a competition as against potential partners who can do kingdom work together. So that's when we started having this conversation. And if I'm excited about today, it's because I get to do that with you, Alison. A hundred percent. That's exactly it, right? We at Compassion talk a lot about releasing children from poverty in the name of Jesus, that's yeah. our mission, but increasingly have been talking about what it looks like to do so in the way of Jesus, right? What we've talked about is the way of being kingdom-minded, kingdom-focused, it's invitational, it's inclusive, it's relational, it's collaborative, yeah. as you said, right? So the opportunity to come together and to be united right, in our love for God, in our desire to um, contribute to the building of a world where every child, every woman, every individual can live a life free from poverty and injustice and flourish in their God-given potential. And then recognize that we're all kind of unique in our role within that, right? Unique gifts, skills, passions, organizations, but all working together towards that end. Absolutely. And there's no scarcity, right, in God's yeah. kingdom. And just to take a grasp of that, I mean, imagine we are looking at a world where five billion yeah. fall out of the protection of law and there are only seven billion people in the world, really. Right. And more and more, what we have been observing is that the bad guys yeah. find all sorts of ways to collaborate, partner together so that they can continue to do evil, right. so that they can continue to exploit the poor and the oppressed. They can continue to take advantage of those who are extremely vulnerable. And I don't understand what we need as organizations, as women, as moms to come together, band against yeah. this heinous crime around, I mean, that's, that's literally crippling yeah. the world. So International Justice Mission's work has been in 24 countries, uh, across uh, 14 partner offices, and we get to do this incredible work with those who love Jesus. Yeah. And we get to do it with amazing partners like yeah. you in the field too, Alison. Uh, 
Well said, Anu. And I'm reminded too that as we come together also in the name of Jesus, in the power of his spirit, imagine, right? The kind of transformation we can experience together yeah. um, around the world. So at Compassion, uh, as you know, but uh, we exist to release children from all forms of poverty in the name of Jesus. And we do so by being Christ-centered, child-focused, and church driven and ensuring that kids have the opportunity to grow in mind, in body, in spirit, uh, in relationship with God and those around them. And to do that well, we have to care for the social structures and the social norms around them, right? Be yeah. it family or church or community. And that's where our amazing partnership has come in between uh, IJM and Compassion. So uh, maybe I'll share a little bit about when I first encountered our work together and, and you can share yours. So for me, me, it was um, a few years ago, actually. So I had been working in Compassion for about seven years before I encountered our work together in the field. For you, I think it was much sooner, but I was in uh, Northern Thailand at the Myanmar border. And there was, you know, confronted and around the reality of the exploitation of ethnic minorities who mm -hmm. were displaced by war. And by extension of that, they were at a higher risk of being trafficked and abuse and experiencing violence. Of course, they didn't have access to basic human rights, you know, no access to healthcare or education, yeah. right? That that whole, you know, not able to buy land as well or leave the area. Yeah. And uh, in that context, in that community, we had what we call one of our frontline church partners. Yeah. So we had a, a Compassion Church partner who cared for 450 Amazing. Uh, children and their families by extension and community. And one of the key things that they did, again, to care for the, the social norms and the structures around these kids to be able to develop them, is they partnered with IJM. And they partnered with your team uh, to ensure that we could get citizenship for these kids yeah. and their families and by extension their community. So that why they then gain access to the rights that they need uh, to be able to get an education, as I said, access to healthcare and be able to develop and flourish in you know, all areas of life. But more than that, just helping that one community, yeah. we've partnered in that same country for IJM to train compassion leaders, train compassion volunteers to help others gain access uh, to their citizenship and to the rights that they need. Actually, Alison, I first encountered compassion through my very dear friend, um, Priya, who was actually a compassion child. Yeah. She's presently leading a country office in protecting girls from female infanticide. And oftentimes I've thought, what would have happened if right. she did not encounter compassion and the, the kind of support that she received as a child? So her life is making significant difference in the life of others. And then absolutely through the work of IGM, I told you before, just the kind of partnership we had in the field, like we just could not do without the other. Yeah. I mean, and tangibly and practically around the world, specifically uh, to call out the Philippines casework, I mean, the casework that we do mm -hmm. in Philippines, mm -hmm. Noel, who's yes. your country, director has been working so closely with us to make sure that a lot of these projects are unfurling perfectly. They gave Christmas gifts and woolens to uh, our survivors when it was Christmas time. It's just amazing, it's you know, amazing. like getting your staff trained in identifying um, online sexual exploitation of yeah. children, like almost I think 60% of, no, 60 of your entire staff in Philippines yeah. were trained in that. It just is amazing to see how, you know, the collaboration drives into, you know, places where it just would not be possible to get there by ourselves. And that's, that's just biblical, right? Yeah. I mean, we are not going to be able to do this alone. We are expected uh, to be doing this in partnership. So answer me this, Anu, how does being a mom and a woman impact your leadership? How are those two things related to you? How can it not? <laughs> like, I mean, you yeah. would agree with this, Alison. Oh. Um, I was born at a time in a place where um, having a girl child was seen as a liability. Mm -hmm. Like, female infanticide was the norm. My parents chose justice when they chose to have me as a daughter, desired to have me as a daughter. Yeah. Um, and I think they're the first ever feminists that mm -hmm. I've encountered in my life. And then growing up, you know, as a mom, I've really embraced experiencing the discomfort, feeling comfortable yeah. with the discomfort of being 
a mother who is in leadership yeah. because it is not an easy path to right. walk in and um and everything about motherhood i think has informed me and my leadership yeah. but before i got to that place there was this line that i was walking i did mention earlier that there are 5 billion people out of the 7 billion people who fall out of the protection of law so justice yeah. is exclusive for them but motherhood is not exclusive right motherhood as a survivor of violence myself i know and i've experienced so many mothers who stepped up so that they could show up for me care for me and help me get back to my feet and i i think that was the line i was walking for several years before i actually became a mother Yeah. When I think yeah. of the children who are trapped in slavery, when I think of those children who are exploited uh through online sexual exploitation, like there are 75,000 predators who are waiting online to get sexual content from children. Right. I mean, we have the youngest child that we have rescued was 2 months old. I don't have to be a mother, right, to cry and and want freedom for that child. So, and I think and that's what that's what Jesus teaches us. You know, yeah. I mean, it is our heavenly father and mother. The the, the nurturing yeah. the nurturing characteristic of God is ever present in our life. And for me to experience that as a mother too, um like motherhood is not exclusive what I want for my children, I want for every other child. So leadership in this space um uh, is a natural if not obvious and a crucial space for me to step into and i do that imperfectly um with a whole lot of challenges mm-hmm. and knowing fully well that i'm going to be facing a ton of criticism for not doing both of it excellently mm-hmm. well it's okay yeah but i choose to show up because that's exactly what i was called to do like you are You tell me, Alison. I'm turning that back to you. <laughs> I'm so glad you do show up <laughs> day in and day out and new and thanks for that imperfectly, but right, we give ourselves oh, yes. to the different kind of hats we wear and roles that we play as women. I I so love that. You know, it's so interesting because my connection to this ministry and part of my uh the calling into vocational ministry is directly related to my children. Yeah. And it was I was leading in the finance industry um for about a decade and it was the birth of my own children that God really used to remind me that my kids had access mm. to different, you know, rights and privileges that other kids around the world did not have merely because of the family they were born into, Absolutely. the country they were born in, right? And it really opened up my eyes in profound life-changing ways, not just to the privilege and reality of my own life and by extension the life of my kids, but to the realities of other moms and yeah. kids around the world, right? As as you said in your or you know um version of that story yeah. right is just the recognition that there are moms around the world who just want their kids to survive another day Absolutely. never mind be able to thrive and so as a mom and before that with a mother's heart but then through the experience of having my own children recognizing yeah. i need to use what god has given to me right not just resources but my my beingness my influence my voice my life on behalf of other moms and other kids and, and the poor and marginalized around the world so that that has been such an intimate part of my story and man how to do that well how to lead as a mom is just this i find just this ongoing kind of balancing act between to, between you know giving your full yeah. and perfect as you said self to all the different relationships that you engage in and you know the community of people around you in both contexts yeah. right in my, my family context at work that we do this yeah. thing called life and leadership together yeah i've, I've kind of stopped balancing or trying to balance <laughs> because it, no, because you're just going to disappoint yourself yeah. you know just saying oh have i done this have i showed up here But the thing is it's not as easy as it sounds but kind yeah. of at the moment try and give my 100% wherever i am right but 
But nobody asks that questions to our husbands, do no, they? It's true. Right? It's true. And it's funny, I, I am noticing yeah. that it is very much, you know, post balance and now it's about integration. Yeah. Like how, how do we integrate, integrate the fullness of who we are and the multifacetedness of our life yeah. into, you know, the relationships that we have? So let's talk about um kind of the significant challenges facing women around the world. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, the global statistics, it's just alarming. This mm -hmm. is a report from the UN. 70% of victims mm -hmm. um, who, are, who, who are struggling under the weight of slavery and violence, women and children. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the population that both Compassion and IJM is trying to yeah. step into. And now with the onset of the pandemic, the crime is just exasperated like nobody's yeah. business. It is 140% increase. So yeah. here we are protecting ourselves from the pandemic, shutting our doors, staying indoors, right. imagining that it's gonna be safe while it is safe for us, but we know that is not the reality around the world. Yeah. Children and women who are vulnerable are the most at risk. Yeah. Um, in, in, and, and crime just increased and we've had to step up and show up. As I mentioned earlier, you know, this is the kind of space that IGM has to show up day in and day out, mm -hmm. you know, putting our lives on the line, having to consider pretty much every single inequality there is because we are all traveling in the same boat, mm -hmm. you know, same storm, yeah. but different boats really. That's it. Just, That's just, it. just trying to picture what it is that we can do to ensure that help can reach those who are oppressed. Yeah. Um, and for mothers, it is all the more challenging. Mm -hmm. It is, we are um, stepping in to right now with the war in Ukraine, yeah. mothers and children are fleeing from the war. They've come to the borders and our team in Romania is stepping up to make sure that they receive all the protection and that they're not trafficked into slavery. Like um, this, is, this is the first thing happens when yeah. there is a crisis, right? When there is not enough food, when there is, you know, violence of this sort, easiest access for predators to come and make money out of these people. So we are at the borders making sure that um, we, are, we are able to support yeah. those who are fleeing Ukraine. And, and it just is appalling to see yet again how women and children you know, stand first in That's that right. space of needing um, support from organizations like ours. And this is one thing, Alison, you are familiar with already. In a time like this, we could be giving them access to several things, but if they're not safe, mm -hmm. getting to that place, mm -hmm. maybe it is getting access to drinking water or going to school, but if they're raped on the way to getting access right. to any of this, is going to make our all our efforts futile. And IGM is really trying to be in that space, to be in that in-between space, and ensure that we can come along and, you know, and love uh, those who actually need to benefit from these services yeah. can access them. So I think the ones who have had it the hardest are mothers. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. And I mean, you know, what we've talked about before and what we know is that gender inequality is the most long-standing and pervasive form yeah. of equality, inequality on the face of the planet. And it means pre-COVID, right? Yeah. Lack of access, lack of opportunity, lack of rights, lack of protection, which is key to the work that you do, and provision, yeah. you know, on the other side of protection. But you enter in COVID and you hit a whole bunch of those realities. I just want to underscore them because um, it's a key part of Compassion's work in this season as well is, you know, we talk about education setbacks. Who's that going to impact the most? Women. Yeah. Why? They're at home caring for their, or girls, I should say, right? At home caring for their brothers and their sisters or working in the fields to provide, to provide income. You know, income in and of itself, women make up the vast majority of the instable and the informal economy, which yeah. means if they can't leave their house earn income as a day laborer, then they can't put food on their tables yeah. at night. And COVID brought this um, um, global supply chain breakdown, right? And now you have increasing fuel uh, prices largely related to Ukraine, which is making food supply short, price high. In the context of what I just described, you have moms primarily who cannot put food 
on their tables for their kids during yeah. the day, right? And that is a huge area of focus for us is food insecurity, supporting, um, you know, vocation and work and income generation activities for these families. But to your point, in order for our organization to do our work, to ensure that these moms and their kids survive and have what they need to keep developing and prospering, we need to address some of the root and contextual issues. Absolutely. Which is violence. And yeah. that is increasing in alarming rates in this season. We tend to think in North America of COVID-19 as being a health pandemic, but it really is this multifaceted oh, pandemic yes. that has a ripple effect yeah. and is creating a crisis for the world's poor and marginalized, unlike anything we have seen in our lifetime. And as you said, health, economic, social, yeah. mental health, um, you know, housing security, food security, and violence and abuse against women and children. Yeah. So we really do need um, organizations like IJM and Compassion every day, um, men, women, children to use their voice, to use their life to advance justice and compassion, don't we? Absolutely. I mean, one can't ex exist without the other. You need yeah. compassion and justice. I mean, again, being a bit metaphorical here, but the, the, the time that the world is going to need to recover, yeah. is going to be a bit intense. And, and I'm not saying it's impossible. It's absolutely possible. But the way to get there is together. And we're seeing it on the field, Alison. So 100%. there is no, yeah, there's no doubt in how that can be done. Yeah. So Alison, tell me a story of a mom that your organization serves mm -hmm. that inspires you. I'm sure there's so many. There are so many, but there's one that has really carried me through this pandemic because I was in Bolivia mm. right when the world was shutting down in March 2020. I'm talking texting our CFO from the airport to shut things down as the world you wow. know, what was closing. And right before that, I had the opportunity to have lunch with a woman named Rosemary. She talked about her life experience and generations of women um, being abused, um, being oppressed, violence against women, largely by those family members, those closest to them. Kind of the, the cultural norms of believing that your first daughter who's born is cursed and is going to continue on this generation of violence against women and her being confronted with the choice and the reality of do I want my daughter to live or not? And what are the consequences of that? But choosing, praise God, life for her daughter. Oh, um, eventually she ended up having five children. Uh, her husband ended up leaving her and it was just an unbelievably tragic and dire situation where she was you know, continuing to be abused, continuing to be raped, unable to provide for her family when she again felt like she was facing an impossible choice and was evaluating whether her and her kids' lives should continue you when her mom stepped in and her mom stepped in by registering several of her kids in the local compassion project oh. right where they could be known and loved and protected by community people who love Jesus and love them and then Rosemary got pregnant again and was entered into our child's survival program so she could also be welcomed into this community with other moms be cared for you know in her prenatal and postnatal and ensure that her young child also a daughter uh, would survive and then be set up to be able to develop and thrive and what I loved about Rosemary's story is fast forward to today over time of course their life radically changed she was introduced to the life-saving and life-changing love of Jesus she began working at this local church to help other kids she was cooking and making meals and now today she is a leader and a tutor oh. in our child survival program so that one sticks with me a lot in this season. for all the right reasons I mean yeah with the birth of a girl child there is a sense of baggage that she has to carry at birth and right. It's so heartbreaking to yeah. witness that as mothers of daughters ourselves. So what a fantastic story. Yeah. Wow. Anu, what is your vision for women as you lead IJM Canada forward, as you just continue to live your life as a woman? What's your vision? Um, to expand on that, I need to share a bit about Thayama. Yes, please do. Um, Thayama discovered that she was pregnant when she was in slavery. Mm -hmm. She was fully pregnant when IJM, with the government officials, drove into the facility where she was trapped for several years in a woodcutting facility. 
for a person who has been under a master for years, I mean, picture this, having a voice of your own is not easy right. because you're constantly living under the fear of what is going to happen next. Right. But Taima, the impetus was the child that was growing within. Yeah. She stepped up and rallied not just for herself, but for the entire community that was trapped along with her and enabled rescue for people. She came out, quickly had the baby in, yeah. in a matter of days, then went on to setting up her own business and bringing in everybody else who was a slave to work with her. She's now a leader, oh an goodness. entrepreneur, and an incredible mom. Now, that is my hope yeah. for women. So if a person who was in slavery once could do this and bring not just herself, but like her entire community out, beautiful. It's just beauty out of ashes. Yes. For me, it is a perfect, I mean, I have zero excuse <laughs> not to wake up and then think of this is what we are gonna do as a group of moms who care about the world. Like I said before, we are called to band together as women who love Jesus, our children as mothers, okay. as women, as wives, to come together and say, this has got to stop. Yes. So IJM's vision is to protect half a billion people by 2030. That's going to happen. That's the, the only Absolutely. question is how soon and who all is coming along. So my hope for moms and women around the world is to do this together. Oh. Amen, Anu. Amen. That just like gets me um, so excited just to walk alongside you and see what God does through the ministry of IJM Canada and IJM globally as you move yeah. forward. You know, for us at Compassion, our vision at Compassion Canada is to see a world where every child has the opportunity to live a life free from poverty and flourish in Christ, where every Jesus follower, yeah. um, you know, says yes to joining God in advancing his kingdom and his yes. mission, not ours, right? Of justice and compassion in their daily going, you know, based on who they are and the gifts and skills God has given to them. And then here's the point, every life then transformed in the process, Yes, right? That it's not about just an exchange of resources or, or signing a petition, although those are needed, Important too. right? Yeah. But it's about coming together in relationship with one another, being united in our diversity, united in our love for God, united in our commitment to walk forward, you know, following Him, by the empowerment of his spirit, to see the advancements of his purposes, yeah. and to see life transformation, right? In my life, in your life, in the life of those we serve, in the Absolutely. life of those we partner with, and to get all women, children, men, old, young, to join God in this mission and see yes. transformation. Yes, so. even to that. Friend, it has been a joy to have I'm this conversation so with you and to meet you <laughs> in person. I so look forward to walking forward with you and your organization as we move forward. Me too. Thank you.